Hello and welcome to episode 5 of D-Lab, which is the Digital League of Assessment Professionals hosted by P4P. P4P stands for Passion for Performance and um, Passion for, for, for Performance continues to be the leading e-assessment platform in South Africa. In our experience, we have been exploring and searching for a way to create a space for assessment in the digital world, hence the birth of D-Lab. So what is D-Lab? It is a collective of assessors, especially created to professionalize assessment within the digital space. My name is Gabriel LaRue. I'm a business owner and I'm also a trainer within the uh, pro audio space. I support a product called um, Soundcraft, you see behind me. Um, today's topic is what does assess when does assessment really end in terms of the assessment process? And we are speaking today to, let me just switch over here, to Michiel van der Skijf. Welcome, Michiel. How are you doing? Well, in you, Gabriel. Very well. Slightly cold yeah. <laughs> in Parktown North, but, very, but well. Um, winter has uh, arrived in Johannesburg, and I'm feeling it. Oh um, if oh you can dear. maybe just introduce you, just a few words, just a little bit of, on your background um, and your work experience. Okay, thank you for the opportunity, Gabriel, and the introduction. Um, so I'm a, a learning and development and business consultant, if you want to call it, give it a term. Um, I have my own business called Vander Consultancy since 2012. Um, I do all things ETD, from facilitation, assessment, moderation, instructional design. These days it's e-learning and online um, mm -hmm. learning development. Um, and then I also have the business side where I assist organizations in um, quality assuring their business value chain processes and um, doing project management for oh. organizations. Awesome. So, so today, in today's topic, we want to look at when assessment ends. But I guess to do that, we need to look at where does assessment start? Where does it commence? Yeah, that's very important. Um, uh, for those that, that read the write-up on the, on the Facebook uh, wall, would see that, you know, the, the really was in brackets because, mm. you know, it, I think it's a, a point of discussion that one could deliberate for, for a lot of yeah. time. Um, yeah. But I think what is important is to understand that there are certain aspects or certain phases within the assessment process. But when the assessor, the appointed assessor, whether he's now employed permanently by the skills development provider or, or the organization, um, or he or she is a, a, a contractor, um, um, even though he or she only comes in at a certain point, um, you need to backtrack quite, um, uh, uh, quite a lot in terms of what is in front of you. Um, so it really starts right in the beginning, you know, when the assessments were designed, uh, the learning material, um, you know, is it still valid? Um, the way that, mm. that the, the instruments are constructed, does it align with certain taxonomies and the sucker level descriptors? So it's, it's not just a matter of, you know, I, I think I used it in my, in my write-up, but tick fever, it, it's not just tick fever, um, you know, and especially in an outcomes-based um, assessment environment, you really want to, to look at the applied ability of, of the person that, that you are busy evaluating or assessing. Um, and it really is a golden thread or golden line that gets pulled through right from the beginning, mm. you know, years ago, mm. even though you only come in years later. Mm. Great, awesome. Um, what are all the aspects as an assessor, what is all the aspects that assessors should look at in your, um, in your experience? Yeah. So that's a good question, Gabriel. I am, uh, and again, I think I might be treading on a lot of toes here this morning, so that's really not the, the aim of the discussion, um, and I'm always open for, 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 for um, discussion. But as mentioned in my previous comment, I, you know, it's, you obviously need to focus on how uh, the newly found skills um, are being applied um, in, in the environment, in the outcome space environment or, or the education environment that you're busy working in. But it's really looking at the tools as well. Um, and I see it these days when I assist um, um, providers to convert their um, instructor-led training onto an, a digital uh, um, solution 
and you actually see that there there are a lot of flaws it's either because they it's it's a off the shelf solution that was was um, purchased to obtain the accreditation it was really never I wonder if it's okay to use the word panel beat it and or, or customized to really suit the training provider as well as the client to, to make sure that it really makes sense in terms of the level um, that, that's been assessed or even the subject matter that's been assessed. Um, you know, I also think assessors need to understand and have good comprehension of what the SACWA level descriptors state, um, you know, and on which level the assessment is being conducted. Mm. For the, uh, in terms of the tool, but also in terms of your assessment practice as the assessor, are you assessing on the right level? Um, you know, I, I always say that the assessor really do have a lot of muscle in the, in the process. Um, use the muscle. Make sure that the the candidate or the learner is advantaged without um, affecting the credibility or the integrity of the process and of the subject matter. Yeah. Yeah. So the so so to, to wrap up what you're saying, so the assessor needs a firm understanding of of the environment and the content before he can start even thinking about assessing anything, right? <coughs> Absolutely, Gabriel. Yeah. You know, and, and there are quite a few um, um, accredited training providers that do that that do it quite well. What they do with their assessor training, they actually include a, a design and development component to their assessor training because you need to grasp the insights as well it's not it's not just here's an assessment criteria and you 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 award um, you you award a competence or you make a judgment according to that it's really understanding the nitty gritties of the whole process and especially the subject matter remember an assessor or a registered constituent assessor is now considered to be the subject matter expert that's why he or she mm. has the the registration with uh, an, an ETQA. So the ETQA relies on that subject matter expertise to to be seen, to to be visible in the way that they mm. that they assess. It's even it's um, for example with marking memos. The, cer certain subjects, um, I'm thinking like a mathematics might, you know, a marking memo is quite strict because you know there's a specific way and a specific answer, um, but a marking memo should not be the only guidance for an assessor um, in the way that 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 judgments mm. are made. It sh it should be a guidance, but not the only guidance. It must be your experience, your understanding of the subject, mm. um, the way it's applied, the, the learning tools, etc. So, what would you say um, from your experience now in the last three years? This this moving into the digital, where's the pitfalls? What's the things that you've seen, the reoccurring pit pitfalls that's happened in this transition? If there is, if Gabriel, I um, I think it's a, it's a, there are quite a few. Um, it's definitely, I think, a lot of times, um, uh, uh, providers um step into a, a muddy pool um, in terms of learning material. Sometimes they do it very well. Uh, they get an instructional designer that's really good, that really is a subject matter expert and really customizes and builds that content and assessment instruments extremely well. Um, you know, as part of a community of expert practitioners with the with a client or with industry specialist and 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 the, the STP, um, but I think the problem comes in, in the generic component of um, assessment instruments, where um, it sort of wants to to um, articulate or speak to the majority of of um, industries or, or um, um, components or sectors or arenas, um, and you know we we call it off the shelf assessment instruments or mm. um, material. So I think that that really becomes a problem. And then also the way that assessors are trained, you know, and that's one of the things that DLAP wants to 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 um, to enforce is to make sure that when you when you are an assessor, um, and especially when you are a DLAP assessor, you didn't just go on the three or five day course. Mm were given a lot of things to tick off and sign off and there was somebody said mm, okay you know what you have some grasp of the NQF and you understand that there's an outcome to meet with certain assessment criteria but really um getting stuck into um, um, um 
the um, academic aspect of it, the subject matter expert uh, um, expertise component of it, and the way that all the components sort of merge together. And I, and I know I throw the terminology around a lot of time in applied ability, applied competence, but that's really where we want to be, is that um, all the other components are, are, are important, but separately, you know, they just that foundational or theoretical knowledge or uh, practical knowledge. But when it all comes together, you have a learner that really has something that he or she can do and he or she won't get into trouble because you as the assessor said you really can do it yeah awesome um who is ultimately responsible for the outcome of the learning journey is it the assessor or is it the skills development provider <laughs> okay um, um i definitely think there is a, a lot of collaboration in, in this one. And um, I hope that I'm not going to get a few phone calls after this saying that um, I didn't do that great with uh, with some people. But um, it's definitely for the assessor really takes ownership of, of, of how it all comes together. Because at the end of the day, the assessor needs to make that judgment. And this STP, the skills development provider, relies on the subject matter expertise of that assessor. Um, and that's why he or she gets appointed. So, um, uh, and, 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 and I, you know, if you refer to one of my comments in the write-up of the Facebook um, post, you will also see that, uh, you know, it, be, it becomes a quality aspect. So if there's a nice synergy um, between an SDP and a, an assessor, it really becomes a collaborative um, journey. Mm. But you know, I so many times tell assessors, it's your registration that's, um, that's been looked at. And if, if trouble comes, it's going to be your registration that gets pulled back. You, mm. um, you, you need to adhere to that code of conduct and you need to be responsible and have buy-in to the learning journey. Yeah, I guess if eventually it will come back to the assessor, right? That is the conversation we just had um, previously. So, I mean, the assessor needs to take premise Absolutely. in that situation Absolutely. And, and make because remember uh, an STP signs an agreement with you mm. a service level agreement and in that agreement you state that I am yeah. X Y and Z and I can do X Y and Z and therefore you're going to pay me for it so yeah at the end of the day it is your responsibility and the repercussions would obviously also come back to the assessor right is that do I understand that correct yes absolutely so um, what is the responsibility of the assessor when the training provider says they won't use a service again if the trainee, trainee is not yet competent? Well, I th yeah, um, I've, I've also been um, victim to that, and I really say victim. Um, you, you unfortunately do get providers um, that are not really in it to change people's lives. They, they it, it's a bums on seat scenario. It's about the contracts, about the funding. Um, but for for the majority, and I and I really do want to say, luckily for the majority of providers out there, it's not that they mm. they do want to equip people. They want to make sure that people's lives are enriched. Um, with, with a certain skill, but also as an individual in the um, society. Um, you know, it's hard because um, facilitators, especially uh, um, assessors, especially contract assessors, you know, you you need the contracts and you, you're chasing the next invoice. But again, I say it's your registration um, that that's that's um, that's been looked at. Um, rather walk away. I know it's hard and especially with economic times mm -hmm. that we are in. Um, you don't want to be involved because you're going to sign <clears throat> off on something. It's going to turn around and bite you in the backside. Um, and especially if it's about compliance aspects, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, where, you know, there's a lot of legislation around it. If, if you if you keep on signing off on a learner that he or she is competent, but he, he drives a forklift or whatever and he kills somebody, mm. um, what then? Sure. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a serious topic. Um, so when you as assessor find that the learner is not yet competent, is it not the responsibility of the facilitator to support the learner to remediate? Um, Gabriel, a hot topic once again. Um, I 
I, I have quite a strong opinion about the fact that facilitators needs to be assessors. Um, and, and trained and qualified and registered assessors, um, even even though they might not assess the specific work that they facilitated, but they need to understand what the assessment process entails. Mm. Um, in the same breath, I, will, I, I say an assessor needs to understand what the moderation process entails, mm. because you, you know where it's going to end. Um, once again, I think one needs to nitpick a little bit in terms of what is it the problem. If if you can see that formative development wasn't done properly, mm. and, and, and an assessor can only do that when you really get stuck into the evidence and the way that the evidence has been constructed and the assessment tools um, have been constructed, um, I would say yes. You need to go back. You need to um, have a discussion with the training provider and say, let's get this facilitator in. We need assistance here in terms of of the formative component, um, you know, especially if you if you see that learners start making a similar mistake throughout the assessment um, pack or portfolios that you're assessing, um, and that they're struggling to, um, uh, you know, a, a, around a certain component, I always say let's go back to how formative development took place, and you know, if something is not a, a problem there, because remember, part of the pre-assessment process is to make sure that the learner understands what's expected of him or her and that they are ready and have been prepared for summative assessment. So in that I say absolutely the facilitator needs, needs to take part in that. Otherwise um, it, it's an assessor journey. Um, remediation is part of the assessment. It's not just yes my, my little report mm. um, I found Gabriel not yet competent your problem. You you are taking responsibility to ensure that that learner meets some criteria, and that's why we make judgments like NYC not yet competent. It means that there's still an opportunity to achieve competence. We don't just say failed. Mm, yeah, it's not yet competent. Um, so you as the assessor then buys into the process, and your commitment really comes into play to say, all right, let's walk this journey up to the point where. The learner's not yet competence has been overturned to a competence. It comes back to that understanding the the broader scope of the work, right? You're assessing Correct. you're assessing this part, but you, you you've noticed that there's a gap in the pre-learning, and that first needs to be be fixed, so we can actually come absolutely. and assess. Ab um, yeah, absolutely. I've got an I've got another question here. <coughs> I think this one is from Facebook. If it is about applied skills, should assessment be a blended experience both in the ETD space and the workspace? And how would that work? Absolutely, a good question. Thank you, Facebook. Um, remember, uh, the, the three components of applied ability is a foundational, practical, and reflexive. So mm. you need to have certain essential embedded um, knowledge to understand how it's done. Um, the, the easiest example that we always um, make um, when we discuss this is baking the cake. You know it needs to get into the oven, but stuff needs to happen before the time, mm. you know, ingredients and the way that it gets put together. Um, so it's understanding what the procedures are to get to that point. Um, so it's also hard that if you if you teach a, a certain foundational skill or essential skill um, in your ETD environment or in your facilitation, and it's hard to go and apply it in the workplace because there's either a lack of standard operating procedures or policy on how to apply it either completely or properly, um, it, it becomes it becomes a, a challenge in terms of application. Awesome. I've got another question. Um, is there ever a not competent rather than a not yet competent? I think it, it ties into our um, what we just spoke to previously. And then how does the assessor then address that um, problem? Um, I've never used the terminology not competent. Um, you, you know, when, a, when a, an assessment process um, continues or progresses up to the point of um, 
verification, whether, whether each QA comes in to verify assessment decisions and, and moderation uh, judgments. Um, what would happen there is if the, if the achievement has not been achieved, right? If, if the learners then not yet competent, they would, the, the way that the EGKA would, would sort of write it into their report is that only partial credits would be awarded to okay. those achieved. And then those areas are still then, I want to use the word open, um, because that's, that's the whole principle of the NKF is that at a later stage, this learner can go back and say, okay, I, I want to tr give it another go. I want to. I want to try again. I have the credits for the the other ten or whatever of the qualifications unit standards. Now I want to try the others and see if I can't um, achieve that competence. So I've I've never awarded, and I've not, you know, in mm. my immediate circles, it's never mm. been that not competent. Um, it's always that not yet, either not yet achieved, or not mm. yet competent component. So it's always working towards that end goal, right? And then filling Absolutely. in the I mean, filling that, in the gaps where we need to. That's part of the principles. Yeah. Sorry, Gabriel. Um, that's that's part of the principles of the NQF. You know, one of the things is lifelong journey, uh, uh, learning. Um, you know, it, it, learning never stops. And and that's why I think you know if, if I look at the first question that was asked today, when does it really start? And I mean, and my mm. topic said, when does it really end? The uh, irony in that is. It doesn't really, you know, <laughs> yeah. there might be a certain administrative process that ends, you know, a report or a verification, but there's always an opportunity to go back later and, and um, develop it from there. I was going to ask that question because that was my next question. <laughs> Does assessment process close um, at the assessor phase? And it obviously doesn't. Um, I think that's all our questions for today, except if you've got any closing remarks that you want to still throw in there before we uh we've got five minutes left <laughs> I just, you know uh, thank you for that and uh, i think you got you can see that i feel very strongly mm. about this and um and, and and i see a lot of providers and i want to say kudos to to the providers and the practitioners that i work with that that really um are committed to changing people's lives and they really want to make sure that they have a quality aspect to the way that they conduct their business, but mm. also in terms of how they develop people and that they do buy in mm. on, on all the principles of the NQF and adult learning and all of those things. And for that, I want to salute you and I'm grateful to be affiliated with you. I mean, one of the training providers that I work with, I've, I've worked with, with for over 11 years mm. now. And, um, you know, and it's just amazing to see how they develop and they always want to improve and, and um, make sure that they they have a progressive attitude towards that. And well done to that. That's awesome. Thank you, Michiel. Appreciate your time. Hope you have a lovely day. I see the sun is trying to come out here in, in uh, Bogdan. <laughs> um, Till next time. Keep well. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Keep well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.